So the major players that we have for the cell mediated line of defense is the macrophage because we need him to present the antigen, the wanted poster to say, hey, this is the bad guy. We need to get rid of him. We also need to have our helper T cells. So we're starting to look at our third line of defense and we're starting to consider the break out of types of lymphocytes that are going to be involved in this process. And the helper T cells are the mediators, they're the go-betweens. And we used an example where we had a student who was the tutor, and the tutor knew lots of different languages, so he was able to communicate and coordinate everybody's behavior. We also need cytotoxic T cells as part of the cell-mediated response, because they're the ones that are actually the effector, they could go out and go do something to another cell. And then what we're going to find is that the cell-mediated defense actually enhances the humoral response, too. So it actually can stimulate some B cells and get a desired B cell response at the same time as it's engaging these other cells. So to do this, we're going to consider the same thing. We're going to consider that we have our macrophage, and our macrophage is our antigen-presenting cell. And so he's going to be exposed to some sort of pathogen with antigens on its surface, that pathogen has MHC1s with a self-antigen on it, right? Self-antigen for E. coli. But our body is going to see an MHC antigen with a foreign invader on it. So that signaling ability is going to become important a little bit later. So this macrophage here is going to ingest that bacteria. It's going to combine it with a lysosome to create a phagolysosome or phagolysosome. We're going to get the antigen broken down, and then we're going to put it on the surface of the cell in those pre-made MHC2 uh, molecules so that we get that antigen presented on the surface. And remember, when this happens, it becomes the wanted poster. So the macrophage was not affected in this. He's dead, dying, and nobody's taken off the staged a hostile takeover and isn't using him for his ribosomes. It's going to be used for his transcription and his translation. So this is simply something that says, okay, we've identified a foreign cell in the body. We'd like you to go out and look for it and to help get rid of it. So one of the things that happens then is that other cells in the body then get to start interacting with the macrophage. And the first cell we're going to talk about is the T helper cell. So the T helper cell um, is typically... Uh, abbreviated with a capital T and then a subscript H to indicate a helper cell. And this is something that's very common in all of the literature, even in the textbook, so you'll see that. Um, these guys are also called CD4 cells. So depending upon the literature that you're reading or where you're getting, you might hear them referred to by their alternate name. I like to call them helper cells, cytotoxic T cells, because then I know what they're doing, basically. I don't have to remember which number, four, eight, or whatever is doing the job. This um, helper T cell is going to be floating around in circulation. Now, a lot of this takes place in the lymph nodes because it's a great place to aggravate all of those T cells as well as the macrophages. But if I was having an immune system response and I actually called white blood cells to the area, we also could see how you could get a macrophage doing its cleanup duty, presenting with this MHC2, and also getting some lymphocytes on site and kind of training them up and getting them activated. So a helper T cell is going to come over here, and he's actually going to have something on his surface that is going to allow him to interact with his antigen. And he kind of bounces up, and he grabs it, and he touches it a couple of times. Some of the literature calls it groping. <laughs> okay? Well, it certainly helps you remember things. So it comes up, and it gropes. <laughs> it gropes a little bit more. And it has to grip this antigen several times because he's about to start a whole mess of chaos in the world, and we want to make sure that this guy is going to start a whole mess of chaos on something that actually needs to be chaotic. If it belongs in the body, we really don't want him starting a whole cascade of effects, okay? So this takes sort of a double and a triple check. It takes him interacting with a couple of macrophages, so we don't get a false positive or a false reading. Does that make sense? All right, so once he's groped a couple of times, and he's assured that this is truly a wanted poster for this antigen. The macrophage and the T helper cells exchange interleukins. Now, 
Some textbooks go out and actually identify every single type of interleukin that's going to be involved, but we're just going to learn them as general interleukins. So we're not going to worry specifically about um, what specific interleukin is being signaled. We're just going to know that there's a chemical that's being passed back and forth. When these interleukin signals occur back and forth, back and forth, it's basically a like, this is what the bad guy looks like. Are you sure this is what the bad guy looks like? Yeah, this is the bad guy. So we want to go out and get that bad guy. Okay, are you sure you really want me to do this? Yeah, I'm telling you, you need to go do that. Okay, let's go do this. It's a whole conversation I just had in my head between those two cells. Okay, what happens then is something that's called clonal selection. What does that sound like? duplicating, right? Making a whole set of clones. So when this T helper cell interacts with that particular antigen and then goes through clonal selection, he creates a whole host of additional T helper cells. And all of these T helper cells are not the naive, uneducated, simple cells that they started out with. They're now starting to become jaded. They're starting to learn about the big bad world out there. So these T helper cells now know specifically that they want to go out and do something about that particular antigen. Virtually all of our immune system cells start out as naive stem cells or naive immune system cells. They don't really know anything. So we're born with them, which is why they're part of our second line of defense, but they become the third line of defense when they lose their naivety and start learning about pathogens in the world. Does that make sense to you? Once I have my whole clone army of T helper cells, now they get to go out and mediate things. And one of the first things that they're going to go out and mediate is they're going to mediate cytotoxic T cells. So we uh, signal this by putting a capital T and then a subscript C to suggest that it's cytotoxic in nature. And then cytotoxic T cells are going to do what the name sounds. They're going to cause cytolysis. But before they go out and just start willy-nilly killing things, right, these aren't a natural killer cell, which is a type of lymphocyte that generally kills. These are third line of defense, specialized army weapons. So what these guys are going to do is also engage with some of these T helper cells. And these T helper cells are going to stimulate the cytotoxic T cell through interleukins as well. That's going to signal the cytotoxic T cell to go out and search for and destroy that particular antigen that we were looking for. So now these guys kind of become like the special like Navy SEALs. They know exactly what the bad guy looks like and their goal is to go out and get them. But how efficient is a Navy SEAL army of one? It's just not going to work, right? So we have to go through clonal selection. And that's one of the benefits to these cytos or these helper T cells using these interleukins. So when this guy gets stimulated, he kicks off and starts making massive, massive, massive quantities of additional cytotoxic T cells. But these aren't your naive, I don't know anything about the world, cytotoxic T cells. These are cytotoxic T cells now, but specifically are aiming at that antigen that the macrophage initially taught the helper T cell about. So these guys now are a whole clone army out there to go attack that particular antigen. Now, what's going to happen if this cytotoxic T cell comes over here and runs into, so what if he comes over here and he runs into this antigen, right? Now he's got a signal. He's got to decide what to do. Do I kill this macrophage or do I leave him be and go look for the enemy? This is where that MHC2 versus MHC1 is very important. When this cytotoxic T cell comes up here and sees MHC2, that's the wanted poster. So instead of killing the macrophage, he's going to say, okay, well, you have the bad antigen. But you also have the marker that says, like, here, well, this is what the bad guy looks like. So the macrophage doesn't get destroyed in this process because the cytotoxic T cells are looking for only a cell that has the MHC1 with a non-self antigen. So if there's additional diseases in the body, 
And typically when our immune system's kind of going nuts and doing this, it is because we've been infected with some sort of organism and we potentially have a disease state, right? So all the while your immune system's working on you know, trying to make you healthy, and in the meantime, you're sounding like this, and you've got a runny nose, and you've got all those full-blown symptoms because you're going through all those stages of disease while your immune system's trying to catch up to speed and get runny, okay? So once this immune system's up and running, if this cytotoxic T cell comes over here and gropes this guy, now he's going to see the MHC1 with the foreign antigen on its surface, and he's going to rain down perforin and granzymes, right? All of those digestive exoenzymes that are going to poke a bunch of holes in this guy and destroy him. Does that make sense? So the cell-mediated response, first off, and believe it or not, we're not done yet, Okay, starts with this macrophage processing an antigen, putting it on the surface and creating the wanted poster. So the T helper cell interacts with it, double, triple, quadruple checks, because we don't want to start an, a, a horrible immune system response if we don't actually need it. Okay. If it's verified that it's a bad guy, pathogen, then we start clonal selection to make a whole host of helper T cells, which is good, because one man as a crier through the village saying that there's like the enemy's coming is not going to be as effective if everybody in the village starts screaming at the same time. So we get a whole bunch of these cells, then as they interact with the cytotoxic T cells, they can stimulate lots of cytotoxic T cells, and you get this cascade effect where we're just amplifying and amplifying the type of response. And these guys are considered an effector cell and that they go out and actually attack the pathogens in the body. Okay, so cell-mediated response realized is these helper T cells that are mediating the interaction between the macrophage as well as from the T cytotoxic T cells. Now, in addition to that, they also interact with another type of cell. The other type of cell that they interact with are the B cells. And when we look at B cells, what we'll find is that B cells can sort of self-stimulate themselves, but they also can be stimulated by the cell-mediated response. So we typically say there's two types of response, an independent response and a dependent response. The idea behind the independent response is that it doesn't need this over here to happen. It can happen all on its own. But if this actually exists, it can assist, complement, improve the B cell type of response. So we have to know what B cells do. So B cells are also antigen presenting cells, which means they also ingest this thing, digest it up, and then plug it onto the surface with an MHC2 molecule and the antigen on its surface, okay? Now this B cell is basically doing this to say like, do I have something that needs to be eliminated or like, do I not really worry about this? It, li it would like some verification of the pathogen. Now, he's pretty sure this thing doesn't belong in the body, so he actually does a little bit of self-stimulation, and that's where the independent B cell response comes from. This is kind of like somebody looking in the mirror in the morning being like, oh, I'm so pretty. Yes, I'm very pretty. In fact, I'm gorgeous. No, I'm really awesome. No, I'm good. I'm hot. Okay? You get that kind of like self-stimulation making yourself feel good. When a B cell self-stimulates itself, okay, it's going to go through clonal selection, which means it's going to amplify that particular B cell with a response against that particular antigen. So these B cells start to amplify, and we get a whole bunch of B cells down here. Now, the thing is, is these B cells actually specialize. The majority of the B cells turn into something we call a plasma cell. And those plasma cells really kick up the transcription and the translation process to create antibodies 
against that antigen. So suddenly we now have a whole host or complement of antibodies that are being produced that are released into circulation. Now we'll talk in a little bit about what those do. But before we talk about what the antibodies do, we have to figure out what the other B cells become. A portion of the other B cells become memory cells. And really, across the body, basically all of these cells can become memory cells. So T helper cells, once the T regulatory cells come through and say, okay, good job, like settle down, calm down, immune system responds over, okay? These guys don't keel off and die, they stay around so that if we're ever infected another time, we can have a much quicker response because I don't have to go through a clonal selection the next time. I already have my army of clones out there ready to attack the pathogen, okay? So this process takes a fair amount of time. In fact, the primary um, response by B cells to make those antibodies takes 10 to 14 days. Is it any wonder we're sicker than a dog while we're waiting for these antibodies to be produced? This process is going to take a significant amount of time because the macrophage, even though he pre-made these MHC2 molecules, so they were ready to plug in, he still has to process that thing. Then it's going to take time for some of these helper T cells to actually interact with enough macrophages for them to be stimulated. Remember, they have to do like a double, triple, quadruple check to make sure there's really a pathogen. And they don't want to listen to just one red or one macrophage. They want to look at several macrophages to make sure that all the macrophages are actually signaling the same thing. This clonal selection takes time. This clonal selection takes time. And here's the cell mediated assistance of the B cell. In the T cell dependent response, these Helper T cells can also interact with the B cell. And when the helper T cell interacts with the B cell, it also releases more interleukin. This is why I used that example of the helper T cell being the tutor who knows multiple languages. So the helper T cell speaks macrophage E's. The helper T cell speaks cytotoxies. And the helper T cell speaks B cell -ease. That's a great name. Okay? So different interleukins for these different cells, but the T helper cell is able to coordinate the activity of all of them. When the T helper cell does this, this is even better than looking in the mirror and self-stimulating yourself. This is all of the other people of the world going, oh my God, you're so beautiful. You're so gorgeous. Man, you're totally hot today. Right? So when that occurs, it goes through a massive clonal selection and produces tons and tons and tons of plasma cells, as well as more of these memory B cells, okay? Now, that's all good. 10 to 14 days, the first time your body goes through this. Once you have the memory B cells, the memory helper cells, the memory cytotoxic T cells, the whole thing speeds up and can occur at a much quicker rate. So we say the primary infection takes 10 to 14 days to kickstart the antibodies. Secondary, or there and above, tertiary, quaternary, no matter how many times you run into it afterwards, it takes between 24 and 48 hours to kick up antibody production. So that example of a head cold I've talked about before, where you kind of feel that tickle of the head cold and you think maybe you're going to get sick, but then it disappears, like you went and took a nap, you drank some hot tea, and poof, it was magically cured. Chances are your body knew about it, and so you kicked up that 24 to 48 hours worth of antibodies and you were able to beat the disease before the disease caused the signs and symptoms in you. Now, that other time where you got that tickle and the itch and you took your nap and you drank a bunch of hot tea and then you woke up with the full-blown illness, your body had never seen that particular antigen before, so it had to go through this whole process to get everything started. That makes sense? 